Did you know that the current delivered to our homes from electric power plants is actually in the form of alternating current? For example, this smartphone here receives an alternating current from the outlet but it has a charger and this charger has a separate internal circuit that converts the alternating current to a direct current. For now, let's represent this system with a simple resistor because it consumes electrical energy and the power plant as an AC generator. From our previous lectures, remember that when we have an EMF source, a constant EMF source, we represent it with these two parallel lines. The longer line represents the positive terminal of that source and the shorter line represents the negative terminal of that source. But when we represent alternating current sources, we just represent it with a wave enclosed by a circle. So this is how we represent AC source in circuit diagrams. Again, we represent this system as a resistor with resistance R and our AC source with this symbol. In an alternating current circuit, the charge flow reverses direction periodically. So in an AC circuit, the device with resistance R receives a voltage that is fluctuating over time. Even if the voltage keeps on changing, we can still register a maximum voltage and we call this the peak voltage symbolized by V sub P. So if I try to plot the voltage across this resistance, it looks like this. This axis represents the voltage level across the resistor and the x-axis represents time. So the voltage fluctuates over time in a sinusoidal manner. So at time t equals 0, let's assume that the voltage is 0. And again, even if the voltage keeps on changing, we can still register a maximum voltage and we call this as the peak voltage represented by V sub P. Examining the shape of this signal, we can represent this voltage V in terms of a sine function. And this sine function is obviously a function of time because it varies over time. Let's represent the frequency of the wave as F. And we need to multiply this phase with 2 pi to force the entire phase to complete one wave cycle after every 2 pi. Recall that from classical mechanics, this 2 pi f, where f is the spatial frequency, is actually called the angular frequency. So we could actually replace this with the angular frequency. Now after completing the phase of this sine function, a wave must have an amplitude a. It must be multiplied in front. Recall that the definition of the amplitude of a wave is that amplitude is the maximum displacement from equilibrium. Apparently, the amplitude we are looking for is the peak voltage in this diagram. So, I'll just represent the amplitude here as V sub P. Now, if I substitute Ohm's law here, V equals IR. In other words, I multiply both sides of the equation with 1 over R. So I'll end up with the equation for current. Let's now calculate the power delivered in an AC circuit. The equation for power is P equals current times voltage. Recall that the equation for power in electric circuits is current times voltage. And if we plug this expression here, so I'll end up with I sub P sine omega T times V sub P sine omega T. And this is equal to I sub P V sub P sine square omega T. V sub P here refers to the peak voltage and apparently in this expression, the maximum value for sine function is 1 and this also implies that if this is equal to 1, then the current is at its maximum. So technically, this is also the peak current. So if I try to plot this expression, if the y-axis refers to the power input in the device, and the x-axis refers to time. Since this is a sine squared function, this will always be positive and hence the plot of this 
function would look like this. The maximum value of this sine function is 1 and during that time, we will be able to retrieve the maximum power input which is IP sub V. So in this graph, that would be the peak power. So this level would be I sub P, V sub P or the peak level of this power input. Now apparently, based on this figure, the average power input would be at this level and that would mean one half of this level and this is equal to one half of this maximum power input. So going back to this expression, the factors I sub P and V sub P are constant and the one that introduces fluctuations here is the sine squared. Using integral calculus, the average of a sine squared function along one cycle assuming one cycle is 2 pi, is equal to 1 half. Let's represent average power in one cycle as p bar. Since the average of sine squared function over one cycle, which is in our case 1 half, so I'll end up with i sub p, v sub p times 1 half. So let me rewrite the average power as i sub p, v sub p over 2. Now let me distribute these two for the peak current and peak voltage so I could actually rewrite this as I sub P over square root of 2 and V sub P over square root of 2. I distribute the denominator 2 here for peak current and peak voltage because we can consider each term as another average value for current and for voltage. In fact we have special terms for this factor and this term here is called the root mean squared current and this VP over square root of 2 is called root mean square voltage. In short, power is actually equal to root mean squared current and root mean squared voltage. So when you have alternating current, it is not usually represented by its peak value like the peak voltage or peak current. A voltage signal is usually represented by its root mean squared value. We can now rewrite Ohm's law in terms of root mean squared values like VRMS and since resistance is constant, in our case, we could simply write Ohm's law in terms of root mean squared values. Using this expression for Ohm's law, we could rewrite average power in terms of root mean squared current alone. Or we could also rewrite average power in terms of root mean squared voltage. Now suppose we connect a capacitor to an AC source. So the voltage across this capacitor will be a function of time and it depends on the voltage introduced by this AC source which is peak voltage times sine omega t. Now from the definition of capacitance we could write the charge in the capacitor as a function of voltage across it. So here I could actually rewrite this as Q equals CV. And since voltage now is a function of time, charge becomes a function of time as well. So plugging this expression here, I now have Q of T equals C times this expression which is V sub P sine omega t. Now recall that current is the time derivative of charge or the time rate of change of charge. Therefore, the current across the capacitor is equal to the time derivative of this expression which is CVP times cosine omega t times omega. So rewriting this, I sub c equals omega c v sub p cosine omega t. Recall this trigonometric identity. Cosine omega t is also equal to sine omega t 
plus a phase log of pi over 2. I could actually rewrite this in terms of sine equals omega c b p sine omega t plus pi over 2. However, at time t equals 0, this becomes cosine 0 and hence it is equal to 1. Therefore, at t equals 0, the current across the capacitor is equal to omega c v sub p. And recall that v sub p is the maximum voltage coming from the AC source. This would mean that this is also the maximum current that the capacitor can have. Hence, we could actually represent this as the peak current of the capacitor. And notice that if I try to divide both sides with current, I'll end up with omega C V sub P over I sub P. Let me transfer this on the other side. We have one omega C equals V sub P I sub P. Now, if our component is a resistor, then this factor here, V over I, would be the resistance of that component. However, we have a capacitor this time, so we could just rewrite this as X sub C. If we have a resistor, this would act like the resistance of the component. But since we have a capacitor, we have a special name for this, and this is actually called capacitive reactants. I could actually rewrite this in terms of peak current. This is the current across a capacitor when it is directly connected to an AC source. Now let's examine the behavior of current when an inductor is directly connected to an AC source. So the voltage across the inductor varies sinusoidally because of the AC source. Now the voltage across the inductor, which is LDI over 2, I'm just focusing on the magnitude of the EMF on the inductor, that's why there's no negative sign here. The voltage across the inductor must equal the voltage coming from the AC source because we want to follow Kirchhoff's loop rule. Recall that Kirchhoff's loop rule is actually based on conservation of energy. Another way of looking at this is that the energy delivered by the AC source is completely dissipated in the inductor because the only component here is the inductor. So rewriting this, di let me put a subscript l here to remind us that this current is the current across the inductor dt equals v sub p over l sine omega t so i could actually transfer this dt here and integrate both sides so i'll end up with i sub l equals integral of vp over l sine omega t dt and since this is constant, I can take this outside of the integral sign and continue evaluating the integral. V sub P here is the peak voltage. So the maximum value of cosine function is 1. If at time equals 0, this would be cosine 0 and this will be equal to 1. And we end up with an expression for negative VP over omega L, which is we could actually consider this as the maximum current the inductor can have and hence we could actually consider this as the peak current because V sub P is the maximum voltage the inductor can have. Now again, if I try to divide both sides of the equation with current so that we could have an expression similar to Ohm's law like V over I, I'll end up with this omega L equals, I'll just focus on the magnitude, that's why I'm neglecting this negative sign. So if our component is a resistor, this term is actually the resistance of the component. But since we have an inductor, we represent this with a special symbol and let's just represent this with X sub L. 
and this actually has a special term and this is called inductive reactance. For an AC circuit with angular frequency omega, we can calculate this what we call inductive reactance for a specific inductor. We already derived the current for a resistor when it is connected to an AC source. So for example, this is a resistor and this is directly connected to an AC source. So from our previous discussion, the voltage across this resistor is V sub P or the peak voltage coming from the AC source times sine omega T. And if I want to determine the current across the resistor, I'll just divide this voltage with its resistance. Now from previous lectures, we already derived that when a capacitor is directly connected to an AC source, its current is omega C V sub P sine omega T plus pi over 2. From previous lecture, when an inductor is directly connected to an AC source, we found out that its current is negative V sub P over omega L cosine omega t. Now since the rest of these currents are multiplied with a sine function, let's try to convert this into a sine function by using this trigonometric identity. Recall that cosine theta is equal to sine theta minus pi over 2. So I can rewrite this as I sub L equals so the negative sign here is also present in this cosine. So when I use this identity, I now have a positive expression for the current across the inductor. So I have V sub P over omega L sin omega T minus pi over 2. Now these are the expression for the current if these components are connected to an AC source individually. Now let's examine the behavior of the current if they are all simultaneously connected in series with an AC source. So for example, I have the resistor here and then an inductor here and a capacitor at this point. The voltage delivered by this AC source is V sub P sine omega T. The resistor is represented by its resistance R. The inductor is described by its inductance L and the capacitor is described by its capacitance C. When they are all connected in series with an AC source, only one magnitude of current flows through them. So that one of the properties of components in series is that they have equal current or only one current passes through them. I can actually describe the current passing through them as I as a function of time equals a peak current which we will calculate or determine later and sine omega t and since each current, when they are individually connected, some of them has an additive phase angle. We don't actually know that whether this is just sine omega t or we need to add a non-zero phase angle. So we will determine the value of the peak current of this system and also the phase angle, whether this is zero or not. When we say phase angle, the phase angle usually describes the amount by which the voltage and current are out of phase in a circuit. So this is also important in an RLC series circuit. To easily calculate or derive an expression for this phase angle, notice that all the currents are multiplied with a sine function and when you have a scalar value that is being multiplied by a sinusoidal function like a sine or cosine, it is easy to visualize their behavior using a phasor diagram. So a phasor is actually a line used to present a quantity that varies sinusoidally and we draw phasors as vectors that rotates with respect to the origin. So for example, let's focus on the current I sub R or the current through the resistor. 
So we could represent the current with a vector like this. And it rotates with respect to the positive x-axis with an angle theta. But recall that angular frequency is 2 pi f. But omega can also be angular velocity when we have a rotating object like this vector i sub r. If this is angular velocity, then this is equal to angular displacement over time, which I can rewrite as theta equals omega t. So I could actually replace this theta here with omega t so that it has a dependence with time. Let me rewrite all the currents here. Through Ohm's law, V equals IR. Notice that this expression tells us that current and voltage are directly proportional to each other. Since we have I sub R based on this expression, it is directly proportional to sine omega t. So if I try to write this in terms of a general expression like I sub R directly proportional to sine omega t minus a phase lag or a phase angle phi sub R. So based on this expression, this phi sub R or this phase angle is actually zero. Next, for I sub C or the current across the capacitor, it is directly proportional to sine omega t plus pi over 2. So if I try to write this in a general case wherein the current is directly proportional to sine function omega t minus a phase angle phi sub c. So based on this expression, phi sub c is actually equal to negative pi over 2. Finally, for I sub L, obviously, based on this, it is directly proportional to sine omega t minus pi over 2. So generally, it is directly proportional to sine omega t minus a phase angle. Let's denote it as phi sub L. So based on this expression, it has a phase angle that is equal to positive pi over 2. If I try to represent the voltage across the resistor with V sub R, so I could just simply use this as a guide since voltage and current are directly proportional. So voltage R is also proportional to sine function where the phase angle is zero. So at time equals T, it has moved with an angular displacement of omega T. Let's try to draw the phasor diagram for the voltage across the inductor or the V sub L. Notice that with respect to the phase angle of the resistance, the phase angle for the voltage across the inductor advances by pi over 2. So therefore, when I try to write the phasor diagram, it must be ahead with respect to V sub R. by an angular displacement of pi over 2. And finally, if I try to write the phasor diagram for the voltage across the capacitor, notice that with respect to the phase angle of the voltage across the resistor, V sub C or the voltage across the capacitor lags behind by pi over 2. With respect to V sub R, V sub C lags behind with an angular displacement of pi over 2. So let me write this on a separate page. So my goal is to get the vector sum of these three voltages and that vector sum would represent the voltage across this combination of RLC 
components. So notice that if v sub l and v sub c are of equal length, then the vector sum would be v sub r. In other words, the voltage across the RLC series circuit would coincide with the voltage across the resistance. However, in reality, if we will return to the expression for currents, notice that they have a factor of omega c and omega l. This omega c and 1 over omega l are not always equal. For example, if you have a very large l, this would result to a very small value of voltage but we usually have small values for L usually it is in millihenries that's why it will result to a huge voltage so in reality if I try to scale the relative length of the vectors for V sub L and V sub C usually V sub L is a little bit longer and V sub C is a little bit shorter with respect to V sub L and this is V sub R. Sorry. So to get the vector sum, with respect to V sub L, it seems that V sub C somewhat points in the same direction with V sub L. It's just that it is multiplied with a negative number. That's why the vector points this way. The vector sum between V sub L and V sub C is... If I try to add V sub L and V sub C, then their vector sum would look like this. And this yellow vector here is actually v sub l minus v sub c and obviously the vector sum between this vector and this vector is this and since this vector represents the vector sum of the three voltages then this actually represents the instantaneous voltage across the rlc series circuit and since this is omega t it advances from v sub r by an angle of phi and this is the phase angle we are looking for in this expression. So based on this diagram, notice that if this is phi, then if I try to calculate for the tangent of phi, I'll be able to calculate for the value of phi since this length, the rise, and the run are given. So tan phi is equal to opposite which is this length v sub l minus v sub c divided by adjacent which is v sub r and from ohm's law recall that the voltage across a component is equal to the current passing through it multiplied to a resistance now this works if you have a resistor as a component but if you have for example a capacitor then we will be using the capacitive reactance instead for the voltage across the capacitor and similarly for the voltage across the inductor if the current across the inductor is i sub r then the constant of proportionality between the voltage across the inductor and the current across the inductor is the inductive reactance so plugging this here. Since they are connected in series, they share equal amount of current. So I will just drop the subscripts here. I x sub L. And for this one, minus I x sub C over I times resistance. And I can factor out the current. The phase angle for our current is therefore equal to phi equals arc tangent of this expression. So this is the phase angle in RLC series circuit. Now going back to this figure, using Pythagorean theorem, we can obtain an expression for the overall effects of these resistances or the overall effects of resistance, capacitive reactance, and inductive reactance to our RLC circuit. So we could derive singular expression that would represent the overall effect of this resistance, capacitive reactance, and inductive reactance. Now based on this diagram, if this is the voltage across the RLC series circuit, we could actually picture this as a right triangle. And using Pythagorean theorem, V squared is equal to 
the sum of the length of this right triangle which is we have this length if I try to translate this into this side that would be the length of this side of the right triangle which is b sub l minus b sub c squared plus the other length of the right triangle is this one so b sub r squared and divide both sides with current I'll have b over i equals r squared plus x sub l minus x sub c squared square root so recall our ohm's law v equals i r if i try to rearrange this in terms of v over i i'll have this expression and notice that this is in the same expression with ohm's law but this time this voltage represents the overall voltage across the rlcc circuit and this current is the current that flows through the entire series circuit so in a way this term actually represents the overall effects of resistance inductive reactance and capacitive reactance and this term actually has a special name let's denote this long expression with a variable let's equate it with a single variable z and this is what we called impedance so the unit of this expression is ohms so in dc circuits we have the concept of resistance but in ac circuits we have to consider the overall effects of resistance inductive reactance and capacitive reactance and we collectively call this overall effect as impedance remember our concept of peak voltage that comes from the ac source if i try to divide this with impedance then I'll actually be able to calculate for the peak current or the current amplitude. And this is the current amplitude we are looking for this equation. We now obtain the current amplitude or the peak current for this expression. And this current actually gives us the current that flows through the entire RLC series circuit when it is connected to an AC EMF source. Let's further examine this equation. I'll expand the denominator by writing down the definition of impedance. I'll rewrite this in terms of their definition. R squared plus omega L minus 1 over omega C squared square root over V sub P. Now going back to this equation, recall that this is the peak voltage or the voltage amplitude coming from the AC source and this is the resulting peak current or the current amplitude of the RLC series circuit. Even for a fixed peak voltage or voltage amplitude of the AC EMF source, I could actually vary its frequency. So in other words, for example, if initially I have this oscillation of voltage coming from the AC source, I could actually increase its frequency like this. So I can actually deliver more variation of voltage coming from the AC source. If I try to vary the frequency of that AC source given a fixed peak voltage, the overall current through the RLC series circuit changes as well. And if I try to plot this relationship, This vertical axis represents the peak current or the current amplitude and the x-axis represents the value of the frequency of the AC source. If I try to increase the frequency, the current amplitude increases as well but after some value of angular frequency it dies down let's denote the value of the angular frequency omega sub zero that will result to the maximum possible current amplitude for an rlc series circuit so going back to this expression notice that we could actually vary 
increase or decrease the value of the current amplitude just by changing the angular frequency of the AC source. But in this equation, if I try to decrease this denominator, and that would be possible if I try to equate this to zero, then I will be able to obtain the maximum value for our current amplitude. So if I try to equate this to zero, then the denominator would be minimum because I'm only left with r squared. So if I try to minimize the denominator by equating this to zero, then I'll be able to get the maximum value for the current amplitude. And if I try to do that, that would mean I will be able to obtain the maximum value for current amplitude and that would mean that I'm actually calculating for this omega sub zero. And this omega sub zero has a special name and we call this resonant frequency. So we call this resonant frequency because resonant frequency is the frequency at which the inductive reactance and the capacitive reactance cancel each other out making the applied EMF and the current in phase. So when these two cancel out, notice that this results to V sub P over R. And that means the overall voltage across the RLC series circuit is in phase with the current. In other words, they behave in the same manner as if there is a resonance between them. If I equate this to zero, I'm actually calculating for the resonant frequency. Let's rewrite this and equate it to zero. Omega sub zero L minus one over omega sub zero C equals zero. Resonant frequency is equal to square root of one over LC. Let me just discuss one practical application of AC circuits. In this system, if this circuit has a voltage of V sub P, just by increasing the number of loop on the other side, we are able to increase its voltage by a specific factor and that's why this system is called a transformer because we are able to transform a specific value or level of voltage into a higher or lower value just by varying the number of loops on the second circuit. In AC circuits, the current is fluctuating over time and hence the magnetic flux is also changing with respect to time. For example, this is our primary source of alternating current. This is our AC source. And across this AC source, we have this voltage V sub P. Let's use the subscript P to denote primary voltage. These connections here are wrapped around this core. Just imagine this is just, for example, an iron core. This coil has N sub P number of turns. And the current that passes through this coil is time varying and we denote it with I sub P. And on the other side of this metal core or iron core is another circuit wherein there is a coil wrap around it and it has N sub S number of turns. Since this coil is connected to an AC source, the current that passes through it is time varying. Since this is a coil and current passes through it, this coil produces a magnetic field inside it. So using the right hand rule, so let's just assume that the magnetic field moves in this manner. portion of the iron core. Since the current that passes through these primary coils are time varying, it actually produces time varying magnetic flux through these secondary coils. From Faraday's law, this V sub P is actually equal to negative N sub P d phi over dt. If we would like to calculate the induced EMF on the secondary coil using Faraday's law, this is equal to the number of turns in the secondary coil times the flux that passes through it. 
So again, in this setup, when the primary coil generates a time-varying magnetic field, the same number of magnetic field vectors will pass through the secondary coils. Hence, both coils experiences the same time-varying magnetic flux. Mathematically, I could write this as the time-varying magnetic flux through the primary coil is equal to the time-varying magnetic flux through the secondary coil. And if I try to plug this here, this is equal to negative V sub P over N sub P equals negative V sub S over N sub S. And this is actually what we called the transformer equation. So if I try to rewrite this in terms of the secondary voltage, I'll have N sub S over N sub P times the primary voltage. So for example, your AC source has a primary voltage of V sub P. When it comes to the secondary circuit, we want to have a secondary voltage that is greater than the primary voltage. So in order to do that, we just have to increase the number of turns of these coils relative to the number of turns of the primary coil. So we just have to increase N sub S relative to N sub P. Therefore, when the number of turns of the secondary coil is greater than the number of turns of the primary coil, then we have this what we call step up transformer because we are literally increasing the voltage coming from the AC source. Otherwise, based on this equation, if N sub S is lower than N sub P, then we have a step down transformer. The transformer in circuit diagram is shown by this symbol. So notice that in this diagram, it seems that just by increasing the number of turns of the secondary coil, we are able to increase the voltage level delivered by the AC source. And it seems that it violates the law of conservation of energy. But in reality, there is a trade-off in this process. Actually, it follows the conservation of energy because the power delivered by the AC source remains constant and it does not increase in the process. So the power delivered through the primary coil is equal to the power obtained by the secondary coil. In circuit analysis, power is equal to current times voltage. Notice that if I try to increase V sub S, there is a trade-off in the current. So when voltage is stepped up, the current is stepped down. So the process that is at play here actually follows the conservation of energy. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and hit the notification bell button for awesome updates. Thank you for watching.